Hey, good morning. Well, we had VBS. That's why we've got it all decked out. And honestly, it was a great experience this last week. If you're a part of that, I want to say thanks to those who were involved. Um, you know, I, my, Mallory and I ran the games. It was, it was fun. And honestly, one of my favorite parts of it is being able to talk to a lot of people that are in our church that are volunteering that I don't normally get a good chance to talk to. So that was one of our favorite parts of VBS. But that was this last week, um, obviously, with the kids coming up and singing. That's what that was all about. Um, well, if you'd like to go ahead and turn to the book of Micah. Uh, we're going to be going through Micah just today, looking at Micah as a whole, looking at really the message of the prophets as a whole. And there's a word and a phrase that's really stood out to me, at least, that I think God is wanting me to stress as we look at chapter 5 specifically. If you've been coming here through this series, we've taken a look at the prophets, and specifically how Jesus, and this is a foretelling of Jesus, we've basically seen the same outline. You know, there's some exceptions. Jonah's an exception. There's some exceptions through the prophets. But there's basically this outline in the prophets. This is what this people have done to mess up God's plan, and this is how God's going to fix it anyway. Basically, the first half of all the prophets is how God's people have messed it up or how some other nation has messed it up and they're done evil and they're going to endure wrath. But then there's the second half, that Isaiah chapter 40 through 60, that second half of Jeremiah, that second half of Micah that we're covering today where there's really this encouraging part. And a lot of people when they're going through the prophets, when they get through that first part of the book, they'll kind of be a little bit depressed and say, well, what does this have to do with me at all? But then they get to this part. They get to something like Micah chapter 7, and they cover some of the more powerful and most filled, rich language to describe the love of God that we have. I want to share with you two of these passages in Micah. Micah chapter 7, this first one, Micah chapter 7, verse 8 through 9. It says this, Do not gloat over me, my enemy. For though I fall, I will rise again. Though I sit in darkness, the Lord will be my light. I will be patient, and the Lord punishes me, for I have sinned against him. But after that, he will take up my case. And then ten verses later in verse 18. Who is a God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over transgression for the remnant of his inheritance? He does not retain his anger forever because he delights in steadfast, long-lasting, enduring love. If you were to read through the book of Micah in these first three chapters, you would be a little bit shocked at how strong the language is that he's going to crush God's people. He says in chapter 3 he's going to crush them down to rubble, imagery he uses throughout the rest of the book. They're going to be like grounding floor so that he can plant something better there. And then you get to this end of this powerful passage. A passage, by the way, Micah 7, verse 8, that if you feel guilty, if you feel like you're just being lorded over with past mistakes, this is a powerful passage that you can use in your own prayers. Some of the more encouraging passages that we have. I was put in charge of our wedding plans. I, or at least one part of our wedding plans, the food. You know, the part that everyone's excited about when you go to a wedding. And I, I've been tired of having punch at weddings. It seems like everyone had the same punch, which is, you know, there's no problem with that. But, you know, for my wedding, I wanted to do it the way that I wanted to do it. So we had a sweet tea fountain. That was the main drink. You, you go up and you fill up your, your cup with sweet tea in this fountain. And, and we also had barbecue brought in. And when we were planning this, we actually ordered way, way too much barbecue. In fact, if we do the math right, it was about a pound and a half of meat per person <laughs> that was there at our wedding. And, you know, we get to the end of, of the wedding, and there's all this meat left over. And, you know, people have driven far. They don't want to take this huge tray of meat back. And they say, you know what? It's your wedding. Why don't you take this home? Why don't you freeze this? Why don't you enjoy this for the next few months? didn't have to ask me twice. This was something I was excited about. You could say I took delight in it. And I, I grabbed it. We put it in our freezer. And for the next month and a half, I ate pulled brisket. I ate all of the fun smoked meats that I enjoy from our local barbecue place. 
You know, when you approach God, just to say it plainly, you don't have to ask him twice to show you love. You know, when you present yourself as someone who can receive love, someone who wants to encounter the love of God, it's not like God is reluctant and saying, well, I guess I wrote that, so this is something that I have to do. I don't know how most of you encounter God when you're praying, how you approach him. But I want you to see this very clearly in the book of Micah this morning. One of the ways that we need to be approaching God is as someone who wants to show you care and affection and love. Someone you don't have to ask twice to be kind to you. See, we find in the book of Micah, especially in chapter 7 of Micah, that God delights in showing you love. When you approach God after you fall, after you sin, it can be so easy to want to avoid Him. To get caught up in this cycle, and I've seen it in the lives of our people here, I've seen it in my own life, of feeling guilty and so you don't go to the one place that can help you. But if we read the Scriptures, if we reveal what God has actually said about Himself, we find that that thought is not coming from us. Not coming from God. No, what God delights is showing mercy and love. That's what we have seen through the prophets so far. Micah is writing this in the midst of pain, not the recovery, not the great part of the second part. He's talking about this while he has fallen. It's always the future tense throughout the book of Micah. I will rise. I will stand up. God will deliver me. He will do these things. But it's always in the future, which is why I find it so powerful that Micah, in the middle of this pain, the middle of the suffering that he is going through for telling the destruction of his own people, he still finds it in himself to write about the steadfast, enduring love of God. As I was reading through Micah, and it's really short, it's only seven chapters long, as I was reading through this and kind of looking for themes, looking for things that Micah kind of emphasizes himself, I, I kind of looked for things that he asks for for himself. One of the things I noticed is not only is there that famous passage in chapter 5, which we'll read here in a moment, about this foretelling of a shepherd that will come out of Bethlehem, the foretelling of the birth of Christ, but actually Micah in his own prayer asks God to send a shepherd. So I want to read for you two passages of Micah, what really is this emphasis of the shepherd that, that Micah puts before us. And it's really the emphasis that I want to put before you today, that God is our shepherd. So Micah chapter 7, verse 14, this is Micah's prayer. This is what he asks from God. He says, O Lord, protect your people with a shepherd's staff. Lead your flock, your special possession. Though they live alone in the thicket of the heights of Mount Carmel, let them graze in the fertile pastures of Bashan and Gilead as they did long ago. Yes, says the Lord, I will do mighty miracles for you like those I did when I rescued you from the slavery in Egypt. Remember, that is fulfilled in Christ. Then Micah chapter 5 verse 2, a passage that you hear around every Christmas time. But you, Bethlehem, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be the ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And therefore Israel will not be abandoned until the time when she is in labor and bears a son. And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord and his majesty, of the name of the Lord his God. They will live securely, for then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth. To say it plainly, Micah both prays for this and God tells him to write that this is what's going to happen, that a shepherd is going to come. This prediction that's happening, what, 700 years before the birth of Christ, that there's this small town, and it was small 700 years ago, and it's small whenever Jesus is born, that in this small town that someone is going to be born from the line of Judah who's going to shepherd his people, who's going to lead them, like, a, like leading them out of slavery, another exodus out of some sort of bondage that they're in, and they will rest again. 
And really, this is the emphasis that I believe God has placed on my heart to share with us this morning, that God has sent his shepherd in Jesus. Jesus plainly, most clearly, calls himself the good shepherd in the Gospel of John. And we've spent so much time covering that in the Gospel of John that I don't want to get too much into that. But here's what I do want to do. I want to look at the book of Micah, and I want to look at the rest of the scriptures and the Psalms, and I want to ask, what does it mean to have God as our shepherd? You know, it's one thing to say, okay, we're going to have green pastures, we're going to have the whole Psalm 23, we're going to have these good things, but really and practically speaking, what does it look like to have God as your shepherd? What are the benefits of having God as your shepherd? And so this morning, that's what we're going to cover. What does it mean to have God as your shepherd? Just two simple points on this this morning. First of all, it means that he leads and restores us. You know, we're all about this here at Hillside. If you go out into the lobby in huge letters, in fact, it's so huge and a part of our wall that you might miss it when you walk in. It's, it's building the kingdom and restoring lives. That's sort of our motto here at Hillside that we believe that one of the things that Jesus offers for his people and offers to the world and part of our message as a result of that is that everyone who comes to Christ can be led and healed by him. Listen to how David starts out his psalm on the shepherd of God. And this is what he says. A psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And he leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. And he leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Now, one of the things that you can get caught up in, and it's really tricky and it's really subtle and it's really dangerous that you can get caught up in. And you might even be thinking this way here this morning when you're thinking about sin, when I talk about sin. It's God's not just rescuing you from the punishment of sin. And sometimes, and many preachers have noted this before me, what we really want God to do is to rescue us from the punishment of sin and not the sin itself. But God did not come down to earth. He did not die on the cross to make sin less bad. No, he came down and died with us to show us this better way of living. That sin in in some capacity, and and we've talked about this so much, and it's really one of the biggest emphasis that I have in all of my sermons, that the better way of living is to actually be without sin. And God is not just rescuing you from this punishment, this distant future punishment of hell, though that's certainly a part of it. No, he's actually giving you the better way of living now, restoring your soul, healing you, from those wounds that sin so engraves in us and makes us callous to. Let me read for you a passage from Matthew chapter 9, describing how Jesus went around and talked about his own ministry and his own heart in the midst of his gospel. Matthew chapter 9, verse 36. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every affliction. And when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. You know, if I could choose just one moment in Scripture to have a picture, it would be this one. What did the face of Jesus look like when he had compassion on his people? When he looked out at the crowds of people, and he had crowds of people following him, and he not only knew that their physical needs were problems, but he looked into the lives of people. He knew, for example, that they were living with people they shouldn't be living with. He knew their history. What was it that drew him to compassion? What was it that he saw in people? And how did he look at those who were listening to him? So just to put that out there, if you're an artist, I'll buy this painting from you. I'd really love to see what it would look like to see Jesus looking out on the crowds. See, yes, Jesus takes away this legal debt that stands against us and condemns us. Colossians 2, 
verse 15. But don't miss what else Jesus is talking about. See, inside of the kingdom of heaven, we are not harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. But inside of the kingdom of heaven, as Micah 5 predicts, this king from ancient times, from long ago, who's restoring this kingdom out of Bethlehem and into Jerusalem, this kingdom is full of people who have their soul restored and are living the more abundant life. See, God has always described sin. He's always described people who've been harassed by sin as people who have lost their shepherd, lost their guide. This is an example here of Jeremiah 50, and these are all through the prophets, this imagery. Jeremiah 50, verse 6. He says, My people have been a lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away to the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone. They have forgotten their resting place. What about you? Chaos is happening, it seems, all over the world. It was certainly for, for several people this week. And a lot of good stuff happened in our own family. This is, this is what happened in our family. We bought our house finally this last week. We're officially uh, permanent residents of here in Marshfield. But not only that, we had VBS. I've got a conference I'm supposed to present at, and I haven't even written a paper for it yet, and it's on Tuesday. So pray for me that I do that okay. And in the midst of this noise, in the midst of this, well, good things, it's easy how distracting, and it's amazing how distracting I can be by good things that are happening all around me, that I forget the most important part of it. I'm being a little bit autobiographical here, but I know, and I've seen this in your life too, that we can become so distracted with good things that we actually miss the most important thing, not to lose our shepherd. Like sheep who have gone astray. See, instead of experiencing the joy that we were created to have in God, we can settle for something so much less important. Because in every case, sin is when you expect something good and end up getting something worse. And while we should be going over there and we should be allowing God to shepherd our lives, to lead our lives, what's so in front of us and what seems so immediately important is so easy to become distracted by it and to chase after it. All the while, God is showing us a better way of living and we settle for something less. The very God who created your desires came down to give you a more abundant life. Don't settle for anything less than the life God has for you. Listen how Jesus describes this in other words. Matthew 11, verse 28. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Church, the world needs to hear not only that God can save them from hell in the distant future. Of course, it could be tomorrow. But the world doesn't just need to hear that. The world needs to see in us that we have found rest in something more than this world has to offer. See, if you go and you ask non-Christians, and this happens on a weekly basis for me, if you ask non-Christians sort of, what they expect will happen when they die, when they, when they encounter heaven and hell. They already know the language of heaven and hell, and generally speaking, our culture knows about that. What they need to see in you and what they need to see in me, Christ incarnate in us through his body as ambassadors for Christ, is people who have found rest in God alone, who have proved the power of this passage, who have proved the power of John 10 where he says, he has come to give us more abundant life. And just to say it plainly, why don't we share Jesus the same way that he shared himself? He's not frequently going around talking about just what happens when you die. He does that in Matthew 25. He does that elsewhere. But most of the time, for example, Matthew 4, 23 and Matthew 9, Matthew 13 and chapter 18, all throughout the Gospels, it's always the same. Usually what he's talking about is you guys are burdened, suffering. You should come and have the better way of living in the kingdom of God. 
can we as a church decide to share Jesus in the same way that Jesus talked about himself? Through living that better way of life. Second of all this morning, and this will be shorter, but I can't help but share this this morning. What does it mean to have God as our shepherd? Well, plainly, he is with us. Mallory's family is originally from Colorado. We lived in Joplin, and and even when we were in Illinois, we would sometimes make trips all the way across Kansas, if you can believe it, to the great state of Colorado. And if I'm counting correctly, I think I've made this journey, counting both forward and backwards, about 15, 25 times. I've kind of lost count at this point. You lose track whenever you're driving on Kansas and the road just goes all the way and you can see the mountains from Missouri. No, but no, Kansas is kind of a, a, a dry state. If you haven't driven through Kansas, you ought to just so that you can build some character. There's not much going on in the state of Kansas. You kind of just get past that eastern part. There's a few stops there and then eventually you get to Colorado and it kind of looks like Kansas. But then you see the mountains off in the distance. But I'm kind of one of those weird people. I know there's a few of us out there who actually really enjoy long car rides. Really, really enjoy it. One of my favorite memories as a kid is when we drove from Joplin, Missouri to eight hours north of the Canadian border in one go without stopping at a single hotel. It took us 32 and a half hours. I beat Metroid on my Game Boy twice in that single journey. But I love those long car rides because that's usually where I finally slow down and have good conversations with the people that I'm with. And it's no different from doing those journeys with Mallory. Long, 12-hour car rides where we talk about what's really going on in our lives and where we find out what's really going on with our own life. And really what's, what's taking place there is, is less about what's being accomplished and where we're going, but it's more about being with somebody that I've Come to enjoy being with somebody. Psalm 23, verse 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Kind of as a joke, but on a serious note, every time I've driven through Kansas, this verse comes to my mind. Doesn't matter if I'm going through Kansas, as long as I'm with somebody I care about, this can be an enjoyable experience. The greatest harm, and I mean this so sincerely, please hear me this morning, the greatest harm that sin does to you and your life is that you can forget that God is with you. The most painful and agony way of living is becoming unaware that God is still with you. And if I could just remember God when I am tempted, then I wouldn't be as tempted as severely. One of the things you can do, and I want to challenge you to do this, is to practice the presence of God. Not to be so sidetracked about doing something for Him, but doing something with Him instead. Let me just say it plainly. God doesn't need you to do stuff for Him. God doesn't need you to do good works for Him. He doesn't need you to sing to Him. He doesn't need you to do anything. He can make rocks cry out. He can make babes cry out. That's what the Scriptures seem to say. And yet He still asks us to do it with Him. The most important thing about having God as our shepherd is not that we do things for the shepherd, but that we do things with the shepherd. Psalm 46, verse 10, very plainly, you find this all throughout the Psalms. Be still and know that I am your God. I'm going to show you a picture, kind of where this came to life for me. This was the last time I was at the ocean, actually, a number of years ago. But I, I used to live about five minutes from this place. This is in Barbados, the most eastern part of the Caribbean. And, and I would leave my... 300, 350 year old house and I would walk and, and I would end up here all by myself and I'd be the only person for miles on both sides. It was beautiful. And these huge waves would come up and you could smell the sea and feel the breeze on those hot days. It was the most relaxing experience I've ever had. And I would walk there every day and I did this for about six months. 
And one of the things I noticed when I would do that, and I, I, I started praying there pretty quickly into it. I found this is the best place in the world to pray. How am I not going to take advantage of this? And I started praying, and I started having all these things written out that I wanted to pray. I started even counting some of the psalms that I wanted to pray every day. And the more and more I kept going there, the less and less I started talking. You can't really describe the benefits of a good prayer life until you experience them. One of the things I noticed, and one of the things that God taught me in my stubbornness while I was there, is that he doesn't need me to talk whenever we're praying. Not always. And sometimes, in the greatest moments that I've had with God, not just there, but even in my office, even in the chairs that you're sitting in, and even on this stage, the greatest moments that I've had with God is when I just stood there and sat there and did nothing but be with God. There's a man, and I, I know I've told this story, but I want to remind you of this definition of prayer, really the best definition that I have to offer about what prayer is. There was this, this man who would stand outside a school and would pray for the, the children inside the school um, for hours every day. And, and so the people started wondering, what is this guy talking about? You know, how could he sit there for five hours and pray with God for so long throughout the day? And so they asked him one day, how is it you're praying for so long? What is it you're saying to God? And these words, ever since I heard the story, it just stuck in my head. He says, I say nothing when I pray. I sit and I look at God. God sits and looks at me. See, eventually you get to the point in your friendship, in your relationship with whoever it is that you love, that you don't always have to be saying words back and forth. In fact, you're not just trying to say words so they can hear them. You're trying to just be with the person. And if I can say anything about being the shepherd and what I see in the scriptures is that God is Emmanuel. That one day we will be with him forever, and he will be with us. There's this great danger, as I've mentioned, of always obsessing and always being so concentrated on making sure we accomplish the things for God that we wanted to. We did that task. We said that prayer. We came to church. We did this. When God is most concerned, and, and if I can understand the scriptures correctly, which I think I do in this case, he's more concerned about doing things with us. When I was very little, when I was just learning how to fish for the first time, I kind of experienced the, the point of this. You know, I have all of these beautiful memories of going with my dad to this York's Pond. These people in our church have this pond, and it would be 90 degrees outside. We'd have a nice, big slushy. You could smell the cows behind you, all that fresh manure. But on those beautiful, hot summer days, as we sat on that hill, and as my dad and I would fish together, and he would hand me his pole, and about two casts in, I'd get it tangled, and he'd hand me a new pole, two casts in, I'd get it tangled, and on and on that went. And honestly, the point of that, and the most enjoyable parts of that, weren't that I was catching fish for my dad, or whether I was doing something better than my dad, it's simply that I was in his presence. And it didn't matter what we accomplished that day, so much as being accomplished of growing closer together. Let me just say it this way. Don't get so caught up in doing things for God that you miss doing things with Him. God is after doing things with you. He doesn't need you to do something for Him that He can't do Himself. You know the term pastor, which a lot of people call me, it's even plastered a few places online with my name attached to it. It really just means a shepherd. In fact, one of the scriptures that talk about being a pastor in Acts 20, when Paul's talking about it, he calls them all elders and all pastors, and that they're kind of an overlapping term, at least in Acts 20, that the pastors of a church are the ones who are supposed to shepherd, to look after God's people. So I, I really, I want to just make this point, and I know I've mentioned this before, you know, Mallory and I plan on being here for a while. We plan on being here with everybody for a good long while, and we need to spend time with you outside of this building. And honestly, to do my job well, to care about people well, I'm going to get to need to know you 
outside of this room. That's one of the reasons that we bought the house that we did and have the space that we do because we're planning on having a lot of people over, especially as things kind of open up and people are more and more comfortable doing that. But it simply takes time. And I want to just send this invite out to you, and I want to make sure that this is so clear that uh, I, I want you to not feel pressured to ask us to do stuff with you, but I want you to know very clearly it's never a burden to do something with people in the church. And that's something that we love to do. We, we have been doing it, but we crave it more than it is currently happening. And so I'd invite you to do that with us. Well, as I was going through Micah and I was looking at God as the shepherd and really this theme that's traced all throughout the scriptures, I really was struggling and summarizing what it means that God is our shepherd. And ultimately, I came to this phrase, what is really the main takeaway, the main point, what I hope summarizes everything that I have talked about with us this morning. And it's simply this. To have Jesus as your shepherd is to experience the love of God that he delights in showing us. At least from the scriptures, what we can see is God delights in showing us love. Elsewhere in the prophets, he says he delights in showing mercy. And we're supposed to be following him as this shepherd. And one of the things that I think I've, I've come to learn through reading Micah and reading through the prophets is that having God with our, as our shepherd and being with him is to learn to experience those benefits that God offers you that you hear about so much. And I was glad this last week, last Sunday, when I was talking with a group in here as part of our Sunday school, and I simply asked, what are the things that you have heard me emphasize over the last two years? And someone, I don't remember who, they, they mentioned just simply, you know, that it doesn't matter where you are, it matters more about what direction you're going. And really, I'm, I'm, I'm extremely glad that that's something that someone has heard me emphasize, because that's what I see in the scriptures. That throughout the scriptures, God cares about where you are, but he's more concerned about what direction you are headed. And having Jesus as your shepherd really applies to no matter where you're at in your faith, that there is a certain maturity that can happen and growth that can happen regardless of where you are in your faith. God has more to share with you. You know, as your pastor, just plainly, the people I worry about the most aren't the ones who are kind of immature in their faith, but they're growing. No, those are the people I'm excited about because there's this rapid growth that takes place. The people I'm most concerned about and the people that really take the most effort to get to learn to grow, like myself, quite honestly, is the people who've been in church for their whole life and who've kind of hit this wall of, well, I know God is my shepherd, I know I trust him, so I don't really need to do much more to grow in what that means. But having Jesus as your shepherd, to put it in another phrase, having Jesus as your pastor, the one who guides your life, is all about always making this growth and becoming. And for many of you here who are Christians and who already know this, you know, one of the things I wanted to stress to you this morning is that there are more delightful things in God that we have yet to experience. I want to encourage you to go further up and further in into the glorious way of experiencing God. And then there are those others of you who have yet to make that choice. And there are some here this morning who have not made that choice of having Jesus as their shepherd, having him as this guide through life who takes on heavy burdens and gives us something easier, gives us a more abundant life, who gives us something more enjoyable, the better way of living, who frees us not only from the punishment of our sin, but the sin itself and untwines it, uncalluses it from our hearts. There are people here this morning who still need to make that choice. So in a moment, we're going to sing a song of praise. And part of our, our time during this, this decision song that we have every week is an opportunity for people to come forward and say, I want Jesus to be my shepherd. I want him to be my life. I want to experience that love that he delights in giving. So if that's you this morning, I invite you to come forward as we sing. Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for the love that you do delight in showing us. And I pray, Lord, that we would be a church who 
um, represents you well and, and all that you have to offer your people. Lord, thank you for being the good shepherd, the one who lays his life down for his sheep so that we can live a more beautiful life. Lord, I pray that you would bless the families that are here and those who are gone today, that you would watch over them. And as a shepherd watching over his flock, that you would care for your people and have compassion and not leave us uh, harassed and helpless, but to be our shepherd and to allow us and encourage us and even pull us to make us inclined to your leading. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
one quick reminder, next week is our veterans event, which is taking place. And Barry's got all the information. He's got maps for that. He's got good info for you for next Sunday. So if you are a vet, get with Barry, and he'll give you all the info that you need for that. And I believe that's all the other announcements that we have. So I'd like to pray for us. There's no name on the schedule, too. I heard voices, but I didn't. What did you say? No meals on Wednesday night for suicides. Yes. Thank you, Tim. That's very important to know. Um, yeah, so our Wednesday nights, you know, we usually have a meal at 6, and then we have our lesson at 7. Um, but we're doing things a little bit different this summer. We're not going to do meals every Wednesday throughout the summer. We're going to do a few things different, some on Sunday and some on Wednesday, but they're going to be spread out, um, not only to give our people a break, but also just so that we have uh, the time to do some other special stuff that we're doing. Um, so there's still going to be a lesson, still going to be at 7, um, just not a meal every Wednesday. So thanks, Tim, for that reminder. It would be a bummer if everyone showed up hungry and then we didn't have the food. Let's pray this morning. Uh, Lord, thanks for this church, for the people that are here, a blessing that they are to, to me and to our family and to each other. And, and Lord, I pray that you would bless the years to come here at Hillside. That as we be a people that is with our God, that you would be with us. That you would guide us and shepherd us. And don't allow us to be harassed and helpless, but to show us the direction that you would always like us to go. Lord, thanks for the grace that many people have for each other in this room, for the love. And I pray that that love would continue to grow more and more. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.